So I'm here with uh, Kelly Leonard, who is the Executive Director of Learning and Applied Improvisation at Second City Works. And he wrote the fabulous book, Yes And, um, which talks a lot about the things we know in our field. Uh, you've been working at Second City for how long? 32 years. 32 years. Yeah. Well, I guess that's a good run mm -hmm. uh, and has worked with many of our luminaries. Uh, so I invited Kelly, uh, I invited you into a call just to have a conversation about the world, our lives, uh, how improvisation is showing up or not. Um, so oh, it's showing up. It is. <laughs> for, for good and ill. For good and ill. Uh, so thanks for taking the time to be with us today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, so I guess first, how are you doing? How is uh, your quarantine going? Uh, we're okay. I mean, you know, it's it's, um, uh, it's the duality of existence, good and bad, right? So so let's talk about blessings first. You know, my, my wife and my son and I are all, all good. Um, Nick just finished graduating uh, college on Zoom. Um, he, he says he, he uh, graduated Zoom laude, um, <laughs> uh, but it was actually cum laude with honors in his theater major. So we're very proud of him. Um, and he, Anne is just finishing, uh, she finished transferring all her lectures uh, to digital formats for a bunch of her students and waiting to see if her comedy studies summer class is going to happen. Um, there is a chance it, it actually would because it's looking like they're gonna reopen, do another phase reopening in Illinois at the end of May, which would allow uh, groups under 10. Um, and wow. I think she has, like, she has like nine people in the session, so it might happen. And then, you know, I've been in charge of transferring all of Second City's um, live workshops to virtual uh, um, settings and, and we last week we delivered 16 of them. Um, so that was kind of stunning and hard, but, but we did it. So we're okay. Um, it's tough though. You know, the, the company went through a bunch of layoffs. Um, the, you know, you get a little stir crazy, of course. Um, you have to create all, I, I, at least for myself, I had to create sort of new norms for, for myself or existing. So I am still up at 5 a.m. I have a whiteboard where I keep uh, the basically when my meetings are um, working out uh, regularly. So all those things are, are things that are working to keep me sane. How, how are you doing? Well, you know, um, similarly, it's a duality. Um, mm -hmm. I am very, very, very busy. Um, I have, you know, a day job and lots of other alternative work projects and they haven't slowed down. So again, the blessing is I have yep. work, I have paid work. Um, the challenge is that I'm very overwhelmed and online living has never been my happiest place. I like being in a room with people, probably mm -hmm. like a lot of us. Yeah. Um, my family is all well. I, you know, I did have a relative who had the virus and that was scary and um, he's better and Good. You know, we are, um, yeah, we're all just trying to navigate these times. I, I think the, the notion of uncertainty is clearly alive and well and yeah. makes me think about our craft a lot and, and what it is we're navigating. And mm -hmm. um, so I'm surprised to hear that Chicago's thinking of opening the next phase so quickly because I, I thought it was pretty... Uh, hardly hit. Well, this, so, so uh, this particular phase uh, uh, coming from our governor, so it's not clear if our mayor is going to agree to it. And it, it's literally no more than 10 people. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a pretty small phase mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and would be is essentially meaningless to most of our business lines and would normally be meaningless to Anne. It's just that this was a smaller session anyway. Um, and, and because uh, nothing else is going on at Second City. She could hold it in our biggest theater, so everyone can be very well distanced. Um, she, and, but today, so this is a good example of how we're all improvising. You know, she sort of checked in with me in terms of, okay, so um, really good improvisers um, are well practiced, and and we're not well practiced in all this thing that we're going through. So I was like, okay, let's make talk to everyone. First of all, do a uh, level check with your teachers if they feel comfortable with Second City in terms of the facility, going through the the checklist so that when you get in the room, you've thought as much as possible uh, in advance to all the things that could go right could go wrong uh, go sideways whatever 
um, and, and potentially have a really fulfilling experience. And, and I would envy her if she got to do that in terms of, you know, hanging out with people. Because like you, you know, we're all social beings, even, even introverts. And, and my wife is mostly introvert. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean that she doesn't draw um, uh, heat uh, from uh, being with other people. And, and you know, we, we are uh, definitely missing that. I mean, I just can't imagine how awkward we're all going to be with each other when we get out of this thing. Right, right, right. And, you know, I mean, it is, it's about connection. And whether you're mm -hmm. introverted or extroverted, it's yep. about human connection. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually living alone right now, which is really strange during these times. Uh, and, and I have a dog, which is great, because mm -hmm. there's another beating heart in my house. Um, so it's, yeah, I, I mean, I think that uh, as improvisers, you know, you talk about ensemble, right? Is mm -hmm. that we get our juice from ensemble. And, you know, people are creating all kinds of ensembles online. I mean, yeah. the amazing creative things that people are doing online is amazing. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm curious to know how it's going for you. So when you talk about your job right now is putting your classes online, are you talking about direct um, improvisational classes or more of the applied improvisation work or both? Uh, so the training center, uh, of which I'm, uh, I'm not overseeing that, they, they moved all their sort of regular improv classes uh, uh, into online uh, formats. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about the corporate work that we do, um, yeah. which is a different kind of audience. So, so with that applied work, um, you know, the people we're in front of, it, it's, not, it's not like a Google Hangout will suffice. And, and what we sort of, the, the, the mode we went into, and I'm very glad we did this, uh, we were sort of listening to our, our, ourselves and, and what we know about uh, improvisation, which is the need to experiment in the new medium right away. So the minute we close down, by the next week, we're like, let's get on. And I had already been in touch with a, a guy at Zoom like weeks and weeks before this, mm -hmm. like we even had any idea that we we're going to shut down. It just was a fortuitous conversation. So they immediately gave us uh, uh, access to, you know, all the bells and whistles and, and bigger audience that we could, that we could reach. Um, and then we realized uh, that uh, this format, uh, we needed to think of ourselves, um, the performance aspect of our company. So luckily, almost all our facilitators started out as performers. Um, so they now needed to bring a different kind of almost television performance energy uh, mm -hmm. to their facilitation. Um, because we can't translate as well all the in-person experiences, we can do breakout rooms and do some of that stuff, of course. Um, but it's not the same, as we all know. Uh, so we added in other assets. We immediately went to, we have a giant video library. Uh, we have all the stage archives. We're like, well, let's, if we're gonna be talking about resilience, let's do a funny scene that can maybe show that so also these people can be entertained. We also added a musical director. Um, so this was something that um, some, a couple of the corporate people made fun of us at first, like, why would you need this? And until they experienced it and they're like, because there's a pandemic playlist that Jesse Case came up with that he plays before the workshop starts. So people, we, we have a dance break. We have people, and he's underscoring. If it gets awkward, you have underscoring to take care of it. I mean, music covers so many of these um, yeah. uh, potential little moments that, that can throw off a, a presentation. So, and we chat and we do polls and we're funny. And, and so I just remember after one of our very first engagements with a major soft drink brand, they, they were like, we have never experienced anything like this. And luckily, they started talking to their friends in, in the learning field uh, who were looking for similar, like, what could you get me that can get my people? This is a wellness initiative that they wanted. We yeah. want our people feeling uh, more resilient um, and, and uh, recognizing how they can collaborate or need to collaborate in these environments. Yeah. So, so this, the switch was pretty gratifying, uh, but not without its glitches. Um, and, you know, when it's, it's funny when you're teaching agility and then your internet goes out. Um, but we have a backup. I mean, this is what we, so we discussed it. We're like, okay, well, it's not, if one person goes down, the other person can step in, you know, cause we're, there's more people on these, in these sessions than there would be even in a live room. It's so, it's funny. I was talking to Elizabeth Howard, who's my, my, uh, uh co colleague who I work with on all this stuff. And she goes, it was so much easier sending two people to Austin, uh, to, you know, go into a room and deliver. Yeah. Then it is, even in our own homes, with all this technology, it's, it, it is harder, uh, but um, never needed more. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I'm seeing the same thing that, you know, and some of the things I'm doing and, and some of the members of the AIN community and, and colleagues, what we're seeing is that, you know, when you use the platform creatively, there are all kinds of things that are possible. Mm -hmm. As I said, people are doing wonderful and amazing things. 
And from my experience, I think at the essence of what it is people are needing and responding to is connection. So yeah. that even when you're on this platform, if you're having authentic connection, if you're having meaningful discourse or activities that get people into that zone, it awakens something in them. Because I think a lot of what's happening online is very superficial, very rote, very two-dimensional, and people are really starving. I mean, clearly, uh, in quarantine and isolation, people are starving for more than ever. Not that they aren't uh, during our sort of normal times or what used to be normal times. Um, yeah, well, that's the, that's the interesting thing about a pandemic and what it reveals, right? Um, and certainly this has revealed uh, the importance of artists. Yeah. Um, it's revealed uh, the inequities uh, that are surrounding us on a day-to-day -day, uh, level. Um, I don't think this virus is racist, um, but I certainly think that we have a country that is. Um, and and <laughs> that's, that's what this is, this is showing. And, and these are important truths that were always there. Um, and now, as, as happens in a crisis, um, they, they get revealed for, for what they are. And, and, and so I think we have a tremendous opportunity uh, to take advantage of all these truths that are laid, laid bare in front of us. Um, and this is going to require massive amounts of connection, as you talk about, integration, um, resilience, um, fearlessness, all the things, all the skill sets uh, that uh, someone practiced in the world of improvisation uh, can use to tackle problems in a variety of fields. So we have to really call on, you know, the, the, the best of what, what we do in aid of um, all the healing um, and, and, and a better future uh, that we're, we're actually this idea of ensemble doesn't mean me and my, my friends, uh, but means me and the world um, and, and where, where truly we have everyone's back. Um, and I mean, you know, it's so interesting, right, that, that you know, where improvisation started in contemporary America uh, at a certain time when these kinds of ideals and these ideas were being talked about in the political universe um, with Viola's work, you know, in the 20s and 30s and, and the roots of that and, and, and this thinking. Um, and, and, you know, how interesting to be now at this inflection point uh, in the world. And I think, I think it's a good one because, you know, I've been at this a while. 15 years ago, people are not taking us seriously. I mean, we would do corporate stuff, but it was not anywhere near the level. You know, I, I would not have been doing work at, you know, Stanford and University of Chicago and Harvard in applied improvisation. Right. Um, but now they are. Um, and so, so that's a change that is fantastic, uh, but also represents, I think, um, a kind of duty on, on behalf of, of you and me and the people in our field to now notch our game up. Um, and, and, and bring this work to the places where it's needed most. I mean, I, you know, I do so much media uh, around this for Second City, just Second City in general. And invariably, I get this question every single time of, of have you thought about uh, teaching our politicians how to improvise? I'm um, getting that all the time, yeah. Right? That is, that is everyone says that, and of, of course. And, and, you know, I mean, like, you know, when, when the Trump era started, but even before, um, you know, I was always concerned of, like, making that, that looking like a cynical move. Um, but it, it, it's really not. I mean, you know, the, the – and, and I think where we're seeing um, uh, governments that are functioning well – um, are clearly ones in which um, it is hierarchies and status are not ruling the day um, here in Illinois. I, I, I have, I'm, I have lived in Chicago basically my entire life, and, and, and I have never been able to say, our governor and our mayor are terrific. That is not a thing that one would say when they come from where I come from. It has just been corrupt after corrupt. I mean, they're all in jail normally. Um, <laughs> At least you no, know where they are. Yeah, but, but, but and, and, you know, Mayor Lightfoot is a fan. She's come to Second City. She uh, appreciates um, uh, the arts and feels they have a place uh, in the discussion of how we live our lives. Um, and so is Pritzker. He's come to the theater. So I think we're kind of blessed in, 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 in that um, because we're seeing the exact opposite in other states and certainly at a federal level. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, it's, it's interesting, you know, the, the, the notion of working with politicians. So my day job, right, is I work in the field of conflict resolution. I'm a professor of conflict resolution. I have people asking me that all the time. And my response is, you know, they haven't called. <laughs> <laughs> they're you not know. going to. <laughs> right? No, they're not going to. And, you know, you know, you know what it's like to show up uninvited at a party. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to respond to something you said and then ask you a question related yeah. to something you said. You know, you know, you talk about the inequities of our world and, you know, they've always been there. And of course, some people are more aware of those inequities than others, typically the people mm -hmm. 
who are suffering them. And, you know, there's a meme that's been going around that says, you know, we're not all in the same boat, right. you know, related to this virus. We're all in the same storm. Exactly. Um, but we're in very different boats, right? Mm -hmm. And so clearly what's happening right now has highlighted the discrepancies and in, in opportunity and access and privilege and who's on the front lines and who's getting sick and who's suffering more just because of compromised immune and health care systems and um, it's it's really a grave situation and uh, it's it's painful when these realities are highlighted in such dramatic ways and yet they've been with us all along yeah. um, and so when you talk about our practice and you talk about you know 15 years ago we couldn't have even have gotten in the room in most of these places and now we're there and people are knocking on our doors except for the politicians right. um, I, I guess two questions is what <clears throat> what changed that we're now in the room um, that would be yeah. I guess, one question yeah well, I, you know, um, the, the business books, um, I mean, you, you know, at, at a certain point, um, uh, liter the literature started catching, ca catching up with us a, a bit here, and you would see improvisation mentioned by Malcolm Gladwell, the popularizer, Dan Pink, you know, the people were popularizing uh, the work of academia, and then uh, Francesca Gino at Harvard, and, and certainly the work that uh, we've done at University of Chicago, and, and, and that others uh, have done, um, you know, begins to be, to be seen. Um, and uh, so I think you've got a combination of um, academic evidence-based uh, um, uh, truths. And, and certainly one of the reasons we fit so well with the behavioral science community um, is it's lock, lockstep with improvisation. You know, the, the whole idea of yes and um, is directly related to behavioral economics and the default setting of people saying no or doing nothing. I mean, it's like yes and is a nudge uh, uh, as, as Richard Thaler has written about uh, and Cass Sustine and others. Um, so I think that's one thing. Uh, I think uh, more women uh, in leadership roles um, and, and, and specifically in sort of mid leadership roles where they're hiring for the training um, mm -hmm. is a help because uh, women tend to be, and, and there's plenty of evidence to back this up, mm -hmm. far better, far better leaders than men. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly ones who are aware and appreciative of the importance of uh, soft skills and we need a better term for, for that because I know, they I are hate that term. the hardest, <laughs> they're the hardest skills. Um, so let's invent that term. Uh, Let's do that. What can we call it? Um, courageous skills, bra courageous bravery, skills, uh, you critical know, skills. Critical, yeah. I mean, right. I always cite I cite the future of you know the, if you go to the World Economic Forum website and they've got the future of work skills. It's storytelling, creativity, divergent thinking, um, problem solving. Yes, yeah. it, it is all the sort of messy human stuff that we. Yeah. What well, you know, it's not on that list. Coding is not on that list. Um, uh, it, <laughs> it's so not. Right. Well, because well, well, because computers are going to be able to do that stuff, and and it's not just the low level jobs that uh, surgeons are in trouble because computers are going to get better, uh, and robots at doing some major surgeries. Yeah. So you know it's going to affect all of us. So, yeah. so I think that that the uh, reality, uh, facts as we know them, uh, the kinds of people who are in, in, in these positions are all reasons that are contributing to it. But I think you know let's pat ourselves on the back. All the work of of the people who we are talking to. We, we've all sort of grown up in, in this world and, you know, to, I know for myself, I was always, when I first started out, uh, fiercely protective of separating the art uh, from uh, the sort of business application. Uh, that was just something that I felt like was important to me because I was coming at, at this as my sort of like a post hippie, you know, dream of what Second City was. Um, but I kept getting hit over the head with the sort of transformative power of this work on everyday humans. Um, and as I've really dig, dug into that in the last five years, it's just, you can't deny what's in front of you. And this work changes lives. Yeah. Um, and it does so um, uh, at a staggering uh, rate uh, when yeah. people come exposed to it. Um, and then, then that becomes a, a, a burden and a passion and all those things that, that you know, when, when you make that kind of discovery. And so, a responsibility. And a responsibility, absolutely. Um, and, and, then, and then for us to also continue to 
um, uh, develop our language and and do more research and more rigorous research. That's that's where we're lacking. I mean, we're borrowing so much research from whether someone did this with music or an interpretation of improvisation, the way they talk about it. I just I you know it, it words are so important and and we forget that a lot of times. I was just on we get we get asked we get hired to do a lot of storytelling work. And I always turn down those gigs when they come to me because I'm like, I don't do storytelling. And, and, and we were digging that on this call today. And I'm like, oh, you know why I have a problem with that? It's because no one knows what they're talking about when they use the word storytelling. Mm. So, so one person might think they're talking about persuasion or sales. Another person is thinking about marketing or, or cra message crafting or message receiving. I mean, it's all these different things and un underneath this, this one bucket. Um, but people just got used to calling you know, things storytelling. Um, and I, so I think in, in our work, we, we easily fall into that when we think in, in improvisation of short form and long form. Mm -hmm. which makes no never made any sense to me because you right. know you don't measure art by time i don't, I don't think games well, versus narrative right you know yeah so bifurcated divisions so i think that we you know we're going to be uh uh reimagining um uh uh the way we talk about our work um and 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 also as we study our work what what becomes more true i know my wife hates the using yes and uh, which is ironic because it helps you know pay to put my children through college she hates um, using the words or she hates using the well she thinks she th she she feels like explore and heighten is what's really happening oh, yeah. there so the language um, sure. And so yes and becomes a convenient bumper sticker, but it's so, so easy to misuse because you can just say the words and then you think that, you know, you've done the job. Um, but it, as I point out to her, you know, that, you, you know, there's, it's not a superpower unless it can be used for evil. Um, so that's, yes and is a superpower and it can be used for evil. Uh, mm -hmm. But yes, the idea of exploring and heightening is really what you're trying to get at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's yeah, less sexy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I like it. And I, you know, I think about, you know, in our community, we talk about this a lot, of course, about yes, and, and it's not literal, and you have to agree with everything you don't like. It, you know, it's about a mindset. It's a spirit yeah. of receptivity and a spirit of exploration and curiosity and connection, right? It's back to that connection is how do you build, um, you know, like, as you say, you know, you're building, you know, you're building a wall, right? You bring, bring a brick, not a cathedral, right? right. So, so you're bringing things to, to the table. And, um, it's it's interesting to see people trying to do that when one of the things that I'm seeing also, and I don't know if you're seeing this in your world, is because so many people have lost work and so many people have lost many, many things during this time, people are scrambling and maybe grabbing a little more than they usually do. I don't know if you're seeing that in your world. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it, this is a massive, you know, science experiment that we're all living in right now yeah. in, in, in terms of behavior. And, and yeah, you know, I went to the grocery store um, last week just quickly to run and grab a couple of things. And they've done a smart thing at my local grocery store where the aisles are one way. Uh, okay. Just to, and they and they've also sort of let, uh, spaced out all over, so you know what six feet is, to have people uh, be distance. And um, out of the maybe thirty-five, no, it's probably like fifty people in there. Uh, two guys weren't behaving by the rules, which ruined everything for anyone in their scope. And and I tried talking to them. I like they're both wearing masks. I mean, I was like, you're wearing a mask. You must either. I mean, they have to at this point. And, public spaces in Illinois, but it was just like, you know, the, 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 you are a bad improviser. Um, and, you know, uh, so, so watching uh, how this is playing out and affecting certain people's behavior, and I'm seeing more people step up than sort of step out. That's yeah. my personal experience. For sure. Um, I, I don't- is winning, for sure. Yeah. So that's a good thing. Um, and also recognizing you know, uh, people aren't good or bad. People do good and bad things, depending. And I have no idea what these stressors were that these people were going through. And so one of the phrases I use all the time is replace blame with curiosity. Yeah. So then, you know, could I become curious about their situation? Like, yeah. what is it that you need to go against the grain here? What are you yeah. fighting? Is someone fighting with you? Are you yeah. not winning in a fight? How can I help you? What can I do to ease your burden so that you can help the rest of us by just yeah. going in this other direction? You just got to turn around, man. Yeah. yeah, no, that's beautiful. And, you know, it's similar. I think when I work with groups or even in my own mind, I, I operate from the principle, everybody has a story you don't know. Kind of yeah. the same philosophy, you know, somebody cuts you off in traffic, you know, it's easy to be like, oh, then when, it, when we used to drive. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, but everybody has a, has a story you don't know. And I, you know, I think also about this, you know, the improvisational tenet of take care of your partner, right? Yeah. Support your partner, have each other's backs. And, you know, it's interesting. We don't have a mask mandate here. 
Mm. And that's become a real touching point for a lot of people because, you know, some of us are wearing masks all the time and, you know, it's the, it's the exercisers, the runners and all the people, yeah. you know, breathing heavily, running right by you mm -hmm. and it freaks people out. Yep. And, you know, the mask is to protect other people, Others. not to protect you. Yeah, so well. I'm kind of thinking, why, why not? Why not? Why not? Even if, you know, and there's all this, people are arguing about the data and the statistics. I'm like, even if there's a 5% chance that you could mm -hmm. help somebody else, why not? And, yeah. you know, it's kind of an individualist rights-based perspective, right? That, you yeah, know, except that, you know, these people wear seatbelts. So, you know, I, I, it's, it's the, yeah, it's the, it's a difficult one because I, I mean, I'm, I'm one of those people who sort of like, let's, let's follow, let's follow the rules that are given to us. And by the way, we can also stay, most of us can stay in, um, you know, and, and a lot lucky. of people are, are not doing that. But also the larger thing is there is a, we are, we are all experiencing a trauma right now. This is, the, I, I, I think it is very correct uh, to name it a trauma. Um, and, you know, uh, and, and I have had a lot of experience with trauma and grief in the last couple of years of my life. And so I've been studying it and I've been looking and I was just reading uh, the leading trauma uh, expert is a guy named Bessel van der Kork. Um, and he has got an amazing book on I have it trauma. in my shelf right there. Yeah. Me, yeah. So how trauma lives in the body. Yeah. And, and, you know, lo and behold, you read farther into that book and he talks about using improvisation yes, and play does. as a way, as a way to heal. Um, and, you know, I was, I, I, I it dawned on me that one of my friends from when we started the second city of Detroit no longer exists, but years and years ago, uh, she became a psychologist, uh, specializing in trauma. Um, and so I got her on the phone and we've been, we've been sort of crafting uh, a potential workshop that we can offer that mm -hmm. sort of brings those worlds together because she never did. Back when she was uh, uh, getting her um, uh, degree um, and she was doing Second City, she kind of felt like she wouldn't be taken seriously in her field in part because she's a woman um, if she brought up this sort of artsy stuff. Uh, so she had put it to the side and never integrated it. And then when I called her and was talking about the work we're doing, it was just like this light bulb went off. And, and I'm like, you don't, it, you don't feel it's going to, I mean, she's an expert in the field. It's at Bellevue. Um, uh, and so, you know, now w w the thing I'm really looking forward to is someone who is so steeped in her particular kind of expertise, who understands our world and our language um, as, a, as a way to create something potentially very, very special. Mm. Well, that's amazing. I mean, we, we do, we have, I mean, the thing about our community and AIN is that we have people using this practice in all kinds of ways. And there are many people who use it uh, to work with, with trauma and traumatized populations mm -hmm. in, in all kinds of realms. There's somebody I know who works with uh, soldiers and war veterans uh, with yeah. PTSD, uh, people who are working with, you know, uh, refugee and, and immigrant mm -hmm. children, mm -hmm. people who are working with, um, you know, domestic violence survivors. I mean, lots of different ways. And one of the things I know, um, as you're saying, you know, play and, and again, back to connection, but also connection to self is yeah. that it really has to be an embodied practice. Cause one yes. of the things that happens, I'm a psychologist, my root discipline, by the way, but mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that happens, right. When we're traumatized is, you know, we get disconnected from ourselves. Right. We get disconnected from our own body. So a lot of the work that I know people are doing is very much about embodied practice. And uh, many, many of our improv activities are rooted in embodiment. Um, so what, what else are you seeing as the, the practices that are working with the, the, the issues of trauma? So we're just at the sort of beginning of this road with this particular um, uh, uh, discipline. So the, the work prior to that, the, the, that we've been digging into around resilience um, has been very, very well received. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're talking about uh, in the context of the corporate audience is um, uh, individual resilience and team resilience. Mm -hmm. And the idea of take, taking your, care of yourself so you're able to take care of others. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, what a, we talk a lot in our regular workshops about getting others focused because we know, you know, some, our eyes are on ourselves all the time. Uh, but in this particular time, um, we have to check that. And we have to check that with everyone to be like, are your eyes on yourself? Ha have you taken care of yourself? Um, and it was funny, we were, um, we were, tr we were working on a workshop virtually, um, uh, one of my colleagues, and she was like, I think your wife has an exercise that would fit here, and she couldn't remember it, so I, I brought Anne down, and, and this was a wonderful exercise uh, that uh, we just added to this, this workshop where <clears throat> um, she, it was called WISH, 
Um, and so uh, Anne Libra uh, invented this. Uh, and what she said was, uh, okay, everyone in the audience, grab, grab a piece of paper and write down a thing you wish you could do right now that you can't. Um, and so mine was swim in, the, in salt water, swim in the ocean. Um, so, okay, now uh, write down the emotion that you think would emanate from, from that. And I was like, I would feel so refreshed if I did that. And so, okay, now in this third uh, column, write down a thing that you can do to provoke that emotion right now. Nice. And I'm like, oh, I could splash some water in my face. I could go for a walk. I, I had like five things. And, and it's just like, it's such a revelation when you get to there and be like, oh, okay, I, I have some personal agency nice. over, over how I feel. Uh, and my emotions, and if I can, if I can ground myself and remind myself in that, I can do my work on taking care of my my partners, uh, in in our group. But we all have to make that other move. We got to put our mask on first, right yeah. before we put on everyone else's mask. Yeah. And that's especially important every day that we're living right now, like we're living. Yeah. Because it is it is a grind, man. I know, and and you know, for all of us. And so, what can we do? in the morning to take care of ourselves. Um, and so I, I have my routine and, and that, that I do. And it, 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 it grounds me for the day. And it doesn't mean that the day is going to be easy. And I'm, but, but at least I'm, I'm sort of prepared and I'm warmed up. It's my, you know, it's, I'm doing my warm up uh, for, for contending uh, in this very, very difficult time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, I spoke not long ago with one of the experts in our community on resilience, and she talked about that very thing, which is, you know, having a routine, um, not rigid and fixed, but having a routine, you know, when so much of what we've lost is any sense of predictability, even yeah. something predictable can be um, a comfort. And, you know, the the ways in which we need to take care of ourselves, right? It, it, it might seem antithetical to, you know, take care of your partner, but but it's really both and it's a give and take mm -hmm. as you, and you talked about. And so many of us in this field are practitioners of caring for others in some way, yeah. whether we're a teacher, whether we're a facilitator, whether we're a therapist, whether we're a trainer, whether, you know, we're a leader of an organization, right? That is the essence of what we do. And there can be, a, a pretty high burnout potential in that work in itself. So taking care of ourselves is a critical element to being able to take care of others. We were just on the phone with uh, a group that works with uh, nurses at a couple of the hospitals here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, they, they wondered, you know, had, had we, and, and we've done a bunch of work uh, uh, in, in this area. Uh, Ann and I helped develop an improvisation for caregivers program uh, with the Cleveland Clinic and Caring Across Generations. Um, and uh, our daughter, Nora, got um, uh, diagnosed with cancer um, uh, about uh, almost two years ago, and we lost her in August. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, during that entire, it was just about a year period where we were mostly at Lori Children's Hospital and Ann and I had developed this program and it's like, oh, all right. And so we used it. We used all the elements of it. And it was so vital to the caregiving experience. It created meaning at a time when easily this could have been, um, uh, a, a, we could have been rendered meaningless or feel all kinds of despair, which we did, but um, we had joy in that hospital room, and we had play, um, and we had connection, and we had meaning, and we had purpose, and all the things uh, that it means to live well, um, and I credit a thousand percent uh, the kind of improv practices we put in order, and the nurses on the call day were saying, there's so, much, there's so much volatility in terms of people aren't working with the regular teams, they're getting put on different units, and there's you know, like, so, so this idea of how do they form bond, bonds quickly. Um, and so what we did, I, I, I could explain to them one of the, one of the techniques that we developed uh, with the Second Science Project at the University of Chicago that we brought into the uh, Improvisation for Caregiver uh, uh, wor workshops was this exercise uh, that we created called Universal Unique. And the idea here is there's loads of science that show that people uh, tend to feel that other people don't want to hear details about themselves. They're, they are not quick to share uh, when in fact the opposite is true. Uh, that when you share even minor details, uh, it facilitates far quicker connection. So Anne created this exercise called Universal Unique where you pick up an all topic like grocery shopping. Should we do it? Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Uh, so um, I want you to tell me just in like 30 seconds, uh, 45 seconds, the universal way that people grocery shop. So when people grocery shop, they do what? They go to the store, they go inside the store, they go 
down the aisles, they take things off the shelves, they look at their list, maybe they take some things not on their list, they uh, put things in their cart, they go to the checkout stand, they wait in line, they put their belongings on the conveyor belt, mm -hmm. the checker rings them, and they pay, they put them in either paper or brought bags, and they put it back in their cart and they go back out to their car or bike. And great. Done. Okay, great. So Barbara, I want you to take a, about 15 seconds just to think for a second about how you personally grocery shop, how you uniquely grocery shop, and then you're going to tell me in about that time what you specifically do when you grocery shop. Nice. Well, this would have been before the pandemic. Let's do before. <laughs> uh, so what I do is I often walk <clears throat> to the grocery store because I'm lucky enough to live near a grocery store I can walk to. I bring my bags. Uh, I talk to the uh, person who's standing outside selling a, a newspaper called Street Roots, which in Portland where I live is, or maybe other places where the, the houseless, homeless population have their own newspaper. And if you mm -hmm. buy it, they, so I talk to him and I buy his paper and uh, I tie my dog outside because I always walk with my dog mm -hmm. to the grocery store and I tie him outside and tell him to wait, which he often, often does patiently, Good. unless I'm inside the store and I hear him barking. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always go to the prepared foods section first because it's right by the door and I see all the yummy things. I'd rather be cooking, but sometimes my life is busy. So I buy mm -hmm. treats. Uh, and then I walk past the breads and the cheese and, uh, and then I go to the fish and meat counters and I buy some things to cook, some things to freeze so I feel well stocked and I usually run into people I know and I talk to them and then I go to the um, checkout and I realize I've bought way more than I can walk home with because <laughs> my ability to estimate is very poor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I walk home with my dog, having to carry very, very, yes. very heavy bags. Okay, so uh, the two versions of, of of that story are very different. If you were in a storytelling contest, I don't think the first version would win. You're not winning the moth with that first one. No, but also, I learned so much about you, um, and we laughed uh, uh, because um, you know humor comes from truth, uh, yeah. and the the truth of the fact that you were going to buy way too much because you can't estimate is so it means. I mean, this is you're speaking to my soul. Uh, I would do that as well. You you stop and talk to the homeless person. I know something about you. I mean, so these little details, even something as banal as grocery shopping, um, uh, create instant connection. Uh, they provoke laughter. I start to see you. Uh, it's a process of individuation, right? I see you as a person who thinks and feels. I see you as human. Nice. And the thing that is, I mean, this is the thing problem in our country right now is that we don't think of the other side as human. We're not right. seeing them as the people who feel and have minds. Right. Right. Um, and in the context of uh, Nora's room, when we're in the hospital room, we would get these different um, uh, nurses and doctors to come in and um, we needed them to not see the cancer. We needed them to see Nora. And so when they came in, it would be like, hi, I'm Kelly. This is Anne. This is Eleanor. She also goes by Nora. We have a 100-pound Bernese mountain dog named Benchley, who's kind of an asshole, um, but we love him. He loves us. Uh, we live in Ravenswood Manor in Chicago. Uh, who are you? Where are you from? And, you know, then they can't just say, you know, I'm Bob. I, like, they, they offer up a few details. And, and the, the ability to create ensemble quickly uh, which is hugely important in a medical setting and so certainly hugely important right now in, in, in a crisis medical situation um, is powerful uh, and, and something that we utilized often. I'd like This is a daily thing because new people were coming in constantly. Yeah. It was just very important that, you know, and, and look, everyone knew Nora's room. It was just that, that was the, the, the nurses would fight to get on, on, on our schedule because, you know, they, they knew that they would have an experience and really have, you know, conversations and they would be also be treated. This is the other thing, right? Um, they need to be taken care of. You right. know, I, like it, the, it, it's crucial. The, the caregiver burnout is a real problem. Right. Um, so, so the ability that they knew that we could take care of them made it easier for them to take care of us. That's really beautiful. Well, you know, I, <clears throat> we don't know each other well, um, but we are on social media together and 
you've been very public and written so beautifully and eloquently about your journey um, around Nora. And I've, I've been, you know, deeply, deeply touched by, you know, your journey and Anne's journey and, um, and the, 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 the generous way you have shared your story because you know, I mean, it's not just your healing, but it's also a, a gift to others, others who, who are suffering loss. And, and I've just been really, amazed and impressed about how you've navigated this time and, and space and really touched by it. Um, There's no script. I mean, this, you know, this is, and, and um, you know, for me, uh, you know, I, I, I started out in my life wanting to be a writer um, and then I became a producer um, and then I became a writer <laughs> and then, you know, I started doing these, these other work and, and the, you know, what started as a way to keep people updated on where Nora was at, which was an important thing, then kind of turned into also a, a way to champion her uh, mm -hmm. through all these amazing, you know, uh, videos people would send us and gifts and just messages of support from all over the world. And then in the grieving journey, which was the, that's not the, that's the journey I was least prepared for. I, I did, I, the traumas I ex experienced up to now, it's nothing like losing a child. It, it can't, it doesn't equate. Um, but the writing really became a refuge because it was my art and it, and, and also it allowed me to sort of name the thing. Um, and, and then by naming it, you, you can deflate it a bit or at least work with it. Um, and so that's really, every time I think I'm, I'm, I'm done, I'm not, and I, and it could be a lifelong, it's going to be a lifelong journey in terms of how to, how to deal with this. I, I know it is. Um, but yeah, so, so for me, it was about, um, I'm doing something for myself and hopefully from what I heard from people is that it was doing something for them. So it didn't feel like such a, a sort of selfish uh, project I was involved in, but really sort of like, hey, this, you know, and, and I, I talked to so many other people who've gone through uh, this, this kind of journey specifically with losing a child, but also people who've lost spouses and, and other people who are dear to them. And, um, you know, it's that, it's that group that you'd never want to be a part of, but, you know, we, we have each other. Um, and, um, yeah, it's 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 a different kind of improvisation. I will say that. Well, well, it is, and I mean, you know, from the universal to the unique, right? So grief and loss are universal. Um, we all have had our unique experiences with yeah. it. Um, I guess um, a question is, what other improvisational practices have helped you during this time? Because I think a lot of people in our community, a lot of people in the world, not I think I know, are going through loss, right? Either yeah. They've either lost people to the disease, they've lost livelihoods, they've lost security, they've lost connection. There's so much loss. So um, what else has helped you? And You know, so there's a, there's a, um, a thread of gratitude that runs through our work. Um, and in all of my reading around grief, um, and then picking up the texts that that always were important to me. I mean, Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. I mean, I, like, I, I still have my cut, right? I have like my dog ear, dog ear, just written in the margins, all that stuff. And I'm like, mm -hmm. this is deeply relevant uh, um, and important work. Um, and so all the gratitude parts, the the sort of you know element of our work, and you know, for one of, one of the earliest. Uh, 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 things that we worked on at Second Science Project was, you know, the scholars asked, asked me after with the yes and stuff, they're like, we get, we get this, we get, there's research around, you know, um, uh, why yes and is effective. Um, but what happens when, you know, you're at a complete impasse with someone? Um, and we ended up developing this, this uh, uh, fourth module called Thank You Because, um, so that when you need to stay inside this difficult conversation and you thank the person uh, that maybe you're in disagreement with or afraid of or whatever it is, um, you are set setting off the gratitude part of your brain and their brain. And the because is crucial because the, you're finding some point of agreement uh, in what they're talking about. And so you're, you're validating, again, them as human, them or, or them as real, whatever it is that's in front of you. Um, uh, but it doesn't mean you're giving up uh, the thing that, that, that you believe. Right. Um, you're, you're maintaining this, this tension. And, and, you know, certainly the, you know, my work, which was mostly for the first part of my career, was about uh, grinding this stuff into comedy. 
that tension was the beautiful place to be for the comedy. That is all where the tricky human stuff is. That's, that's where we are collectively laughing at a thing that we just suddenly realized was given an expression on stage by an artist that we just couldn't even have imagined anyone could have done two seconds earlier. Um, and again, that's palpable and powerful because it's true. Um, and it's reflective of, of you know, real human behavior. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I have been on a gratitude kick and, and, and also saying it out loud. Uh, so there is uh, loads of science that that indicate the fact that you need to speak your your truths out loud or speak other things out loud. I I, I often tell the story of my friend um, Allison Wood Brooks, who's a professor at Harvard. Um, I talked to her. I go, she's like, do you do a ton of speaking dates? I go, I do a ton of speaking dates. She goes, do you get nervous? I go, every single one. Mm -hmm. I said, I never am. By the time I'm up there into it, I'm fine. But I always like go at myself before it. And um, she said, instead of saying out loud that you're nervous, say out loud that you're excited before you go on. Yeah, it's the same bodily response, right? Exactly. It's just, it's like there, stress works both ways. It's not right. that stress is a bad thing or even a good thing, but you want to drive peak performance. And I'm like, oh, so I just sort of say this out loud and I've done that now all the time. And so I've started to apply that to lots of things <laughs> that I say out loud that I maybe want uh, or I, I, I think are, are good for me in the moment. Um, and so like, what am, what am I grateful for? It's, it's Anne's exercise all over again. It's like, what, what am I grateful for um, inside even all this, this, you know, terrible stuff? I had a professor at University of Chicago ask me the other day, she said, what are you going to miss about the, this, this sheltering place part of the pandemic? And I said, um, shared vulnerability. Mm. I've never in my life had this many people sharing their own vulnerability um, together at one period of time. And it's beautiful yeah. um, and it's revealing. And, you know, we're, <laughs> you know, we're, I've, I've, I think I've met you in person once, right? Twice. We were twice. Together, but twice. We I mean, twice. And now you're in my bedroom. So, <laughs> I mean, that's a level of vulnerability. I love that. <laughs> I didn't know which room I was in, but now I know. Now you know. <laughs> well, you know, I appreciate that so much. And um, when you talk about naming things, one of the things I think about a lot with the gratitude uh, world and the gratitude practice, I know also that for some people, it, it, it makes them feel like they're not allowed to feel the other things too, right? Yeah. So talk about a yes and, it's both and, right? You yep. know, like shining your light, naming all those things that we're grateful for and making space for the hard feelings because both are true and both are necessary, right? Yeah, well, this, you talk this is true. out of that stuff, mm -hmm. right? It's true of everything. I mean, you know, there is no joy without suffering, um, there's no light without dark. Um, yeah. And, and uh, you know, what we know about the human brain is that we have a tendency to move right into that fear, flight, you know, right. fawn, all that stuff. And, and, right. and so, you know, improvisation is so beautifully um, structured, uh, especially in the way that we teach it, so in my experience through the Second City Training Center, of getting at the, you know, the, those earliest, Im the earliest improv classes that we teach are essentially mindfulness classes. They are essentially like, how can I get you to stop focusing on yourself to, to just calm yeah. your mind? Yeah. Um, and, and, then, and then let's slowly have you sort of give you some skills for now moving out of yourself into relationship. And then from there, how, how can we make that relationship, you know, blossom and, 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 you know, turn these, your true idiosyncrasies that we get you to reveal um, that you see as your absolute gifts. So mm -hmm. your, you know, your process of grocery store shop, shopping, um, quirky, lovely, uh, revealing, beautiful, um, that that's the kind of stuff that you want to use. And, and what we know, the bulk of our students have a very hard time uh, unearthing their own truths. Um, and I think that that is a, that is a central truth of humanity. Um, you know, people are not telling their best stories, which are their real stories. So for us to sort of provoke that um, means that this, this idea of, I think, I think we would be in a much better world uh, if it was one where uh, sharing your vulnerability was a uh, prerequisite uh, at the beginning of a meeting. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm all for that world. And um, uh, yeah, that's the world I want to live in. And, mm -hmm. and again, if there are things that are coming out of this that are moving people in that direction, uh, I'm all for it. Right. I'm just, I, I know we're coming to the close of our time, but I 
I'm thinking about one of the things you said in one of the TED Talks you did um, that your son Nick talked about when he was eight years old and why he loved improv so much. He said, what do you say? If you're nice and you're funny, you're popular. Yep. Um, so nice yeah, popular. That's, that's the world we want to live in. And, yeah. and kindness, right? The Dalai Lama says, my religion is kindness. You know, and uh, I think if we start there and we use some of the skills and practices of our craft, I think we're we're on our way. Well, what, yeah. And one of the things I love about improvisation is that, you know, uh, it doesn't mean that you're walking to that space, a kind person. What improvisation does is make you uh, behave kindly. Yeah, it's a muscle. And and by the way, that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a contagion. Um, it's viral, just like this pandemic is. So it, people can catch it. Um, and it's a good thing when they catch it. It doesn't it's mean we, we, <laughs> yeah, we, we don't, we won't have, or if we're sheltering in place, it'll be fine. It was just real kind with whoever we're with. Uh, but no, I, I, I think, and it's funny, you know, um, thinking back to that story when Nick was like 10 or something, you know, and he just graduated from, from college and he wants to be an actor. Uh, and he's, he, he improvises, but he's, he's more interested in sort of traditional, uh, like Shakespeare and stage acting. Um, but, but the world he's entering into, and, and I, I, I was saying this to him the other day, I'm like, as hard as this is, one of the things the pandemic has revealed is our absolute need and love and nourishment from art and artists. Yeah. Um, the kind of work that we're seeing online, I mean, I, like the dance work. I, I have a friend who's in like the Zoom dance company that is putting together these like, they're just stunning. And then this guy who recreated the dirty dancing thing with his lamp. Uh, which came up this morning, which was beautiful. And Yo-Yo Ma coming on and playing. And, and Patrick Ellie's work. Alvin, and yes. And there's so, so much work that's happening that is, and, and people are just flocking to it and sharing it. And so, you know, th they're, what we're realizing is that in our greatest crisis, we are turning to artists. Yeah. Um, and, and that is, what a, what a incredibly powerful job that you're going to be walking into. And yes, we don't know what that's going to mean exactly. Um, and we don't know how soon we're going to be able to gather in theaters. And I worry for the Broadway model. Yeah. I mean, not, I, I feel funny worrying for Broadway, right? Because it's like, I'm, I'm worrying about like five millionaires or <laughs> billionaires, because that's who makes the money on Broadway. Uh, but there are actors and other people who, who make their living, of course. Um, but indeed, like, is that going to be something that is viable uh, going forward? Not in the short term, uh, ho hopefully in long term, but we're not done with these. This is the, the cl climate change and, and the other things that are happening here are, are all, we're all coming down the pike anyway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a what, what, what a good improviser can do is um, uh, imagine uh, the new universe as, as they are creating it. Um, and and this, this ability to separate analysis from creation, mm -hmm. but, but use both. As, as you move forward is a very unique skill set uh, to, an, to an improviser who at least creates like Second City does content, you know, and, 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 and things that are, are sticking around. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that uh, is going to be a skill that is going to be treasured with whatever it is that the world is going to look like in a year, two yeah. years, five years, 10 years. Absolutely. And I think back to earlier, what we were talking about is the skills that are being named uh, as essential, you know, empathy uh, uh, is very, very high on the list. So yeah. to be able to do what you're talking about is that, you know, quick pivot and imagination in the moment, um, while be, being fully present and, you know, in empathy, I think is, is really the gold of what our people can do. A kind of rugged empathy. It's, it's not going to be easy. Empathy. Rugged empathy. Maybe that's the new name for soft skills. Maybe. Let's try it on. <laughs> well, I really appreciate your taking the time to talk with us. And um, you inspire as always. And it's exciting to hear about the work you're doing. And uh, I'm imagining we'll stay connected to find out what comes next, as Keith Johnstone would say. Absolutely. Thank you, Barbara. Okay. Thanks, Kelly.